Good evening and welcome to Sunday evening worship as we come together in the Lord's house on this Mother's Day and once again, Happy Mother's Day. And um, I know we have several out this evening that are spending time with their family, so we're ex uh, excited for that as this is what today is as we enjoy what God has given us in the, uh, as far as our families and our mothers. And uh, we do uh, continue to pray for those that are on our sick list. And I do have a couple of announcements as well. As you enter the sanctuary this evening is a, a, a chart for a sign up for a time of prayer as we move in toward Impact Yadkin. It'll be 24 hours of prayer. If you'd sign up for a time, it's half hour increments and you can come here to the church to pray if you like or you certainly can pray wherever you may be. So if, if you would sign up for that, it'll be out here for the next few weeks as we fill that chart as we pray for Impact and just the organization of it. And it's a little bit different this year as we're trying to organize in a different way, but God will certainly take care of that. And we just uh, pray for our families that we assist and all of our students and adults at work and throughout the county. And we have a 21 churches that are now uh, signed up to serve alongside Impact Yadkin. And I'm excited for that as God will work in those churches as well and the lives of those young people and have the opportunity to be together. And the schedule is just a little bit different, but we'll be getting that out to you as well in the next week or so at our meeting. And uh, as we do uh, a little bit different schedule this year because the impact is different, but we're also opening the door up some, to some new ministries that God has given us. And that's what the target is, is really to reach the community and provide for the community a way that they come to know Jesus Christ. And But do sign up for a time of prayer. And also, Tony left a food schedule in the fellowship hall as we will be serving about 200 plates a day here at our church through the meals as we, uh, with our own participants, as well as Bethel Baptist Church is coming alongside with us and uh, Mount Carmel French Church will be also be taking part here with us and uh, have a few from Enon Baptist coming here. So as we merge together to work and to bring churches together that uh, if you would like to participate with food or just buy some food for that, you can sign up as Tony has placed that in the fellowship hall. So there's a lot going on and uh, there's a lot lying ahead of us as we move toward summer and um, toward a mission trip as well as serving here locally when Yakin County to what God has got us to do. So let's pray this evening. Father, we thank you for a Sunday night we come together and we just come to celebrate Christ and we celebrate Mother's Day. And Father, we just celebrate your love to us each and every day in your presence in this church. And Father, may we continue to be faithful to what you've called us to do and Father, to just to be obedient. I just pray for this church and church family and even the celebration of two babies today dedicated to you and that Father, we as a church have the opportunity to pray for these young people and to pray for these young families as they nurture and raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. And Father, we pray for those in our sick list this evening. We lift them before you to heal and strengthen and Father, in difficulty and hardships that people face. And Father, we thank you for Impact Yadkin and our mission trip to Wyoming and just the other activities through Vacation Bible School and the so many things that go on in the summer. And Father, that we just do all things here to glorify you in Christ. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. We're going to kind of take a bit of larger chunk of scripture tonight. We're in the book of Acts chapter 27. And uh, Last week, you know, we looked at the first part of it, the vo uh, Paul's voyage to Rome that had begun, and tonight we're going to take a chunk of it all the way to verse 38, because uh, next uh, Sunday night will be the baccalaureate service, if you'd like to come to that, it's at 7 o'clock, and we're actually hosting it at Enon this year. Uh, I've got a speaker coming from Southeastern Seminary, uh, Dr. Scott Pace, who's the dean of the uh, college there, and a uh, Southeastern professor of theology. He'll be coming to challenge our students, and uh, we have uh, several of our own students and those that are in our Fellowship of Christian Athletes. They'll be sharing their testimonies, and it's a student-led service, and if you'd like to come and be a part of that, you're more than welcome. That's next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock in Enon, and to honor our graduates and those that come, and we're able to give them a Bible and just distribute them the Word of God. And so uh, do pray for that, and that's next Sunday night. And one other note, this past week we have several of our students at Forbush and at Starmount that are going into the military. And we had a ceremony for them this past Wednesday morning. We had some prayer at the uh, flagpole. We had about uh, 75 kids that came, and we spent some time in Bible study, and we recognized those students and gave them a military Bible. And what a privilege we have here in this community and in this county to still distribute the Word of God on campus and to pray and to have Bible studies. And it was student-led. We had five kids to give their testimonies. And we recognize those students that are going to serve our country and where God opened that door. So uh, do be in prayer for them as this past week was National Week of Prayer and we participate in that at the school and just to see our students come together and to lead and we pass the torch to them as they continue on their journey as we do next week as well. As, uh, but do pray for those students and our FCA as God opens the door on, at, at our school, Starmount, and the two middle schools. We're, 
in the process of beginning Bible studies there and to where God opens those doors. So thank you for that. But we are on this journey to Rome, and uh, tonight is a little bit different in this, in this journey because, like I said, we're going to pick up our pace a little bit because I'd like to finish the book of Acts this year, and uh, we actually will finish up with Sunday night Bible studies the last Sunday night in May, so we only have two left. And uh, because we go the next Sunday following that, will be Impact Yadkins. So uh, we'll go straight into that. So time moves very quickly. But we are in this journey as he makes his way. And we're going to look at 27, 27 through 38. But on the journey there, I'd like to just stop around verse 9 and to look as Paul is boarding the ship to go and to what God has given him, a warning to what is going to take place. And he begins to share that as he looks here. And it says, Now when much time had, had been... and now, when much time had been in spirit and sailing, and now it were dangerous because of the fast that was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with a disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. So Paul is giving them a warning of what lies ahead. He's making this journey to Rome, and um, a lot of times in our own lives, God maybe uh, teaches us lessons through hardships and difficulties where he places us. And here, Paul's journey to Rome is being carried out, but God has allowed him to see what lies ahead. He says it's going to be dangerous, and that's based upon the time of the year that they're sailing, and they're going to actually make their journey uh, in the Mediterranean and actually toward the Roman Empire there in and the uh, in the boot, I guess, of Italy, but they're going on the coast of North Africa. And in the winter, in the North African coast, is very dangerous, and the seas are very rough. And in in that day, as it is today, but especially then, it was very difficult to sail. And that's what he's saying. We don't need. We do not need to go any further. We need to stop where we are. But it says here that that he's perceiving the loss, but nevertheless the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship that things to be smoking by Paul, so they begin their journey. And, you know, I think we sometimes get in hardships and difficulties in our journey of life because of other people's decisions and how it affects us. Paul had said what he needed to say that the Lord had given him, but now he's being challenged, and they continue to make this journey and continue to make their way toward Rome, even though God has given the warning, the apostle has given the warning, but the helmsman says it is safe to go, so therefore we're going to go. And to push the cargo forward, and probably the owner of the ship was seeing dollar signs in his eyes if he waits with his cargo and holds up in a, a port for a, a winter the money that he's going to lose. So he's much more willing to push forward than he is to stay because, I guess, of running a business or a company is what it requires, and that's what he's seeing here. And so they begin their journey. They begin to go at, back toward Rome, as they have said, and to make their way there to, to where God is taking them. And that's going to carry us over a little bit as we, like I say, we're moving forward to what's occurring as we move toward uh, in 27 around to chapter, verse 29. It, as they're making their way there and they're caught up in the storm that is beating their ship. And they've, they've docked one more time and they've now continued the journey to make their way. And it says in when the, verse 27, it was in the 14th night had come and they were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. About midnight the sailor since that they were drawing near some land, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then the fearing, then fearing le lest we should run aground in the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, and they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes, and the skiff led it afar. So what I want us to look at really is to stop there and to see what's taking place. And this is not a, it's kind of a picture, I think, sometimes in our own lives in this scripture. as what it says, it is in the night, in the 14th night that they have come together. And this, I think, is a picture for us and maybe, maybe metaphorically written in symbolism of the night. And I think also often in our own lives, the night comes. And with the night comes fear, and the night comes uncertainty, and sometimes in the night comes worry or it comes danger. It happens in our lives that the night comes upon us because I think we do sometimes get in that part of our life in a struggle or a worry about a child or a worry about somebody in our lives or we're, we're worried about things taking place in our lives or the difficulties or the hardships. That is when the night falls. And that's what it says here. And midnight has come. And the, it says in the 14th night, 
They had been struggling on this ship for 14 nights. The night had come upon them. The darkness was upon them, and they were not sure. But they did sense the fact they were going to run aground, so they began to test the water with the depth of the water, and it says it was at 20 fathoms and then 15 fathoms. And if you catch what it says, and they were a slow drift heading toward the rocks. They were making their way slowly in the dark of night toward the rocks. And for a wooden vessel sailing upon the sea, rocks was not where you wanted to be because the rocks would destroy the ship. They would bombard the ship and knock holes in them until, and it would really just knock in holes in the hull of the ship, therefore sinking the vessel. That's what they knew would take place as they neared the land and they knew the water was shallowing, so they decided they had to drop anchor. And I think sometimes in our life, in this picture, that can happen to us too. We're getting in the shallow water, we're getting in the hardship of our life or a part of our family or something that we just don't really understand. It is the dark of night and it's getting worse and it's getting worse and you know that it's going to happen in a crash, it's going to happen in destruction and so therefore we begin to drop anchor. And we drop those anchors and I'm not sure if you've ever read the book or not but I read it years ago. We had an evangelist come here to Yadkin County 30 years ago and he spoke of a, he was doing a, a presentation and speaking but he spoke of a book by Max Licato called Six Hours One Friday and I'm not sure if you've ever read that book or not but I, after he mentioned it I went and I read the book and what he was saying was Max Licato he had a ship, a, a boat and he, was, he lived near the seashore and a hurricane was coming. A hurricane was pushing in and an old I guess seaman there was on, I guess around the dock and he had, he had grown up there his whole life and he was talking to Max who was a young guy in his teens and he was saying how am I ever going to protect my boat because if it sets in here it'll be beaten to death by the waves against the, against the docks and against the other boats and he told him take your boat out to, out to sea drop four anchors one on each side and hold on and you'll ride it out and so he did he took the boat out to sea he dropped four anchors, one on each corner of the boat, and there rode out the storm. It was rough, and it was windy, and it was dangerous, and it was wet, and it was hard. It was the dark of night, and he was terrified to death. But when the daylight came, his boat had survived. He dropped those anchors around the edge of the boat, and that's what took place. And as I was working on this message to, for today, I was thinking a little bit about what are those four anchors. What are those anchors that Max Licato wrote about in his journey and telling this story about his own life? And what are these anchors here they are dropping? They are physical anchors that are holding this ship. I'm well aware of that. But what are those anchors in our own life that we begin to drop and we begin to place on the bottom? And one is faith. That we have the faith in our lives just to trust the Lord. And Hebrews chapter 11 teaches us exactly what faith is. And uh, sometimes that can be hard for us to even understand. In Hebrews 11, 1, 1 through 3, the definition is give, given for us as we, as we read, and it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. What he's saying is here that we begin to trust the Lord because moving into chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith. And it begins to take individuals throughout the journey of Scripture and define the faith that they had in the Lord. The faith just to trust God. To trust God for Abram to move south and to trust God as Joseph was imprisoned and away from his family and his brothers. And the faith of Daniel as he went into the lion's den and the faith of the three Hebrew children who stepped into the fiery furnace. And it continues to go forward of Noah who had the faith to step and to build an ark in the middle of the desert. And that these people stepped forward in their faith. That day in and day out they walked to the Lord. And I think about that in our own lives as that is one of the anchors that we have in our journey is the faith that we have just to trust God. And it is very difficult to trust what we don't see. It's very hard. It's very hard for any of us. What we cannot see and what we cannot actually understand and what we cannot put our hands on and what we cannot grasp physically, that we trust. That we trust the Lord to guide us and to teach us and to prepare us for the next part of our lives and the next day on our journey, that we drop that anchor of faith because 
The dark of the night often comes in our lives when things happen to us and we struggle and we, we're fighting these battles. We're fighting spiritual battles and we're fighting the battles maybe at home and we're, maybe it's a, a child that has gone away and we're trying to just work all these things back in our life and we drop that anchor of faith and begin to trust God in that journey. And what is that faith? And what is faith to us? And I wrote down a few things of what faith is and faith is imperishable. That the things of this life are perishable. They go away. No matter how new the car is or how much money lies in the bank account or how many acres of land you own, they're they're perishable. They'll go away. They will dissolve away. They will get old or you'll pass away and they'll still be sitting here. But faith is imperishable. That we put our trust and our faith in Christ, our trust and our faith in God to teach us and to train us and to move us forward. To put our faith in something that never goes away and with Christ that never changes. He's a never changing God. And then we begin to trust him in this world of change. This is a world of change that we live in. If you look back two years ago, we've changed in an abundant way, have we not? In a way of life that we thought would never change, it has changed completely. But God has never changed. And that's where we see this day. It's one of our anchors is the faith. It's imperishable. They would trust him. Faith is uncorrupted. The power of God is uncorruptible. That we have the very power and the authority of God with us. The same power of God that transfigured Christ on the mountain. It's the same power of God that opened the Red Sea for Moses to cross. It's the same power of God that gave David the courage to step in front of Goliath and take the stone and to throw it at him with a slingshot. It is that same power of God that we have today in reading the Word of God and trusting the Word of God and following the Word of God. What did it say in Hebrews 11? That we trust that Word, that what, our testimonies, is that not what it said? That we, by faith, we understand. We understand that, that the world was framed. And in verse 2 it says that we have attained a good testimony. And that's given through the trust that we have in our Lord. That we know that there's power there. And we trust in that power. We trust in that authority to make that stand for Christ when we're the only ones doing so, but we anchor ourselves in that. Thirdly, faith is a little bit more. It's unfading. Jesus never changes. He never changes. The truth he has taught has never changed. Now, we've attempted to change the Word of God and call it different words like acceptance and diversity, and we begin to bring these thoughts into our minds, but the Word of God teaches what it teaches. It teaches us to hold each other accountable and that we're held accountable for our sins. It teaches that the Word of God is the inerrant and the infallible written of God. It is the power and the authority to teach and train and rebuke and reproof and hold, us in our, hold our feet to the fire. That's what it is. We may not like what we read, but it is the truth. It reminds us that God loves all people. And that we are called to love. And in loving them, share Christ. In loving them, it doesn't say that we accept sins. It says that we love people, and, we, and for we're all sinners, but we have that love for others and sharing them with Christ. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting and unchanging God. Faith is standing on the truth of God. Faith is revealing. It re- and I was, as I was working, it says, and I, in studying it, it said, reflects, faith reflects our deeper knowledge of Christ. And I think that's true. The more you grow in your faith, the more you grow deeper and closer to God. I've watched that. I've stood by the hospital bed of someone that was passing away, and that's one thing I've noticed in their lives, and them sharing Christ and the strength they have grown in the, in the Word of God and growing in their faith in God, it has revealed in their heart truly what's important in life. I don't think I've ever stood by the bed of someone that's passing away that requested for someone to bring their checkbook to them or to bring money to them or to bring things of this world to them. What they've revealed there is a believer in Christ, of their faith. As they've come to that point in their life, they're saying, praise be to God. Praise be to God for their family and for the love God has given them and the strength they have. That's faith. That's what faith, that's what an anchor is here. We drop that anchor Just like Max Licato dropped that anchor, and just like these men on the ship dropped that anchor to begin to hold the ship, we dropped that anchor of faith, and we trust God in this uncertain world. And fifthly, it was centered in our love for Christ. That's where our faith is. It's centered on Christ, and we trust Him. 
We drop that anchor and you drop it tomorrow when you go out to work or go out to school or wherever God takes you in a day's journey. You drop that anchor of faith in the morning when you're reading your Bible and you've prayed and you go out the door and you're ready for whatever God brings you. You're strengthened for whatever God brings you. You're standing on the trust and the faith of our Lord. That anchor has been dropped. What does it say here that says they dropped four? What was the second anchor they dropped? And I was thinking here of hope. That's what it is. An anchor is a symbol of hope. And in reading throughout Scripture, and just that, that, that is a symbol of hope in our lives. If you got your Bible, go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. And that's a very familiar passage to us as we read it over so often at Christmas. And we read it as... Uh, and also, we're going to flip from there to Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, if you're finding that as well. And we'll read these two passages as they really define for us the same terminology. But it reminds us what hope is. Matthew chapter 4. What hope truly delivers and what hope truly brings in our lives and what God delivers us through that hope in our existence today. In Acts chapter, in Matthew four sixteen, and in Isaiah chapter 9. And what you have to remember, these, in Isaiah's time as we read this passage, these people were living in exile. They were living, they were living imprisoned. They had been carried away from their homes and from their families and everything that they knew. And it says in verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. And we know the story, for there was gloom, and there was despair, and there was death, and there was destruction. There was separation that was taking place in the lives of Israel. And these Hebrew people, for their captivity, they had been taken away. And as Isaiah reminds them, that you walk in darkness, you're in a dark foreign land, in the shadow of death, but there is a great light, and that light has shined. What he's prophesying there is of the coming Christ. He's telling of the coming Jesus. He's telling that the dark of the night and the gloom and the despair and the hurt will go away because there is one coming far greater, and that's the Christ. It's a hope. When these people are listening to him preach, there is a hope. There is a hope in the despair that they're given because they know there is more to come. They know there is one far greater to come because that is Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, it's a repeat of the verse. It says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the, in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. That light is Jesus Christ. That is the hope we have. And now some years ago, a popular TV show or movie actually was the C.S. Lewis uh, book. I don't know if you've ever read his series called The Chronicles of Narnia, but I'd read them years ago. But one was the story of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and that was on at the theater. I remember taking our youth group to watch that. And it's, it's just a, a, an, it's an allegory is what it is, an allegorical picture of Scripture. And it is a dark time in Narnia, this faraway land. And it's C.S. Lewis, who was an, an atheist, a doubter of the Word of God, who would find Jesus Christ and be saved. And he transpired what he knew in his writings. Really, he shared Christ. And in those stories was the story of Jesus Christ and the authority of Christ and his presence. But it was a darkness. It was upon, those, upon that city. But it was interesting, there was a light to shine forth, and that light that would come forth was Christ. It was the lion, the lion that would come forth, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Christ would come forth. He would be the shining light. He would radiate the light in a dark world. Friends, that's what we have today. When I pick up my Bible and I begin to read of the Word of God and read and study the truth of the Scriptures and the authority of the Word of God, we live in a very dark world. We live in a gloomy world. If you watch the news or read the computer or read the newspaper, it's a gloomy world. That's where we live. It's despair and it's darkness and the things that are upon us. But Jesus Christ is that light. That's the anchor of hope. You drop that anchor of faith and you drop the anchor of hope in the other corner. And the third anchor you drop is surrender. That you must surrender yourself, surrender your thoughts, and surrender your ways to God. That's what it says in Galatians 5, chapter 6. We won't read it, but it defines for us freedom. That we find a freedom when we find Christ. We are set free from the bondage of the world. And it begins, I mentioned it briefly this morning, but freedom it begins to separate those parts of our lives. That we have that freedom of reconciliation. What that is actually saying, our attitude. Does your attitude re reflect a positive light of Christ or does your attitude reflect the gloom of the world? 
And I've been in places and, it, and when the people talk, it is gloomy all the time. It is the problems that are going on all the time. It is the struggles that are taking place all of the time. And then we do. They're, that's the world. That is the world. And it's always going to be that way because the world is without Christ. It is always going to be gloom. It is always going to be despair. It is always going to be that. And we have got to be very careful in our own journey as Christians not to get called into that. That, well, I think we have to see the problems that are around us and recognize them just as the apostle did in the ship who says there's going to be a, it's going to be dangerous, there's going to be a loss of the cargo, a loss of the ship, and even the loss of lives. He knew, that, he knew what was lying ahead, but in this journey he brought forth Christ, did he not? He shared, the, he shared the truth of Christ. He was set free from that bondage. The ship went on, he went with it. It is a freedom of release, that we release ourselves into finding Christ, and it is a freedom of vision, and that we have that vision in our lives, and we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear in our service to our Lord Jesus Christ, that we drop that anchor of surrender. We've anchored our boat on the hope. We've anchored our boat on faith. We've anchored our boat in our lives upon the very truth of surrendering to God, and the last anchor is thanksgiving. Do you catch what it says in 35 through 38 of our passage in the book of Acts, chapter 16? He, he says, we see the anchors that have given, and then he takes us to this interesting part of this passage and the problems that are going on and the struggles that they're facing and what is taking place. And it says, And as the day dawned, Paul implored them all to take food. Today is the fourteenth day of you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take the nourishment, for this is, the, this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from your head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. Catch what it says in 36. And they were all encouraged and also took food themselves, and all were 276 persons on that ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. Do you catch what's taking place? In the midst of the danger and the dark of the night, and the suffering, and the hurting, and the pain that was there, Paul is displaying to them a thanksgiving. It says what he did, he took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, he participated in the Lord's Supper in front of these individuals and shared Christ. He was on the ship with them. He was fighting the waves with them. He was in the midst of the dark night with them. He was there when they dropped those anchors. He was in the midst of all of this. But do you catch what happened? He didn't get caught up in the gloom and said, I told you so. I told you it was going to happen. I knew without a doubt we were going to crash. I knew this was going to come upon us. I knew this was get Let's throw somebody into the sea and let's hold other people accountable. You notice he never said that. It says he took food. He took the bread. He broke it. He gave thanks. He says he encouraged them in the word of God. Friends, that's where we are in our daily journey and our walk. And we drop those anchors of faith and hope and surrender, but drop that anchor of thanksgiving. You drop it to the bottom and it anchors you there and you go out tomorrow and you go out this week and you're in a world that's really, a, it's a carnal world, it's a world absent of Christ, but we have that privilege in our lives just as the apostle in the midst of the dark night where he was seated in the midst of the dangerous seas that were being upon the ship, facing the rocks where they were gonna hit, he took the bread and broke it and gave thanks and said glory be to God. Glory be to God. And I think of the apostle. He's on this journey. He's on the journey toward Rome. And then the danger that was there and what would lie ahead, he gave thanks to God for what he had given him. And I think as believers, that's what we're called for. We have a light to shine, my friends. We have a light to shine in our lives, and it's Jesus Christ. We have a light to give others, just as Isaiah said. You're living in the gloom and the destructions of this world. But let me share with you one that's far greater, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the light. He'll set you free. Finding and trusting him, and it, it comes to a testimony that we have an obedience to our Savior, and that's our Lord. That's the anchors they dropped. Now, we, what I gave was an illustration of those four anchors. They, they dropped the anchors to save the ship, but we dropped those anchors in our own lives to hold us steady in the storm, to hold us steady in the darkness that we are encouraging to others and that we share with them the light of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a Sunday evening we come together. Thank you for the privilege we have to worship. Thank you for the apostle's life, that you gave us pictures and examples to him of his journey. Father, it was a long journey, just as our lives, too, are their journeys. 
and that we go through the dark nights and we go through the suffering and the pain. But, Father, we, we look into you as that you set us free from that bondage, and we find you as the light of the world. Father, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for a church. And that, Father, for those that aren't here, you watch over them. That, Father, that we as leave this place, that you take us from here challenged to serve you. In Christ's name, amen.